One of the most important constitutional commitments of a monarch is to remain separate from politics. But Prince Charles, as he was, spent the best part of his life advocating strongly on a range of different causes. Martin Fletcher has written for the New Statesman on the politics of King Charles. So Martin, the Queen reigned for 70 years. She had 15 prime ministers, but we still know very little about her political views. Why? Because she is constitutionally, was constitutionally required to remain above politics, remain politically impartial. I mean, I can think in my lifetime, and I'm 66, of perhaps four or five occasions on which she let the mask slip. The first one, funnily enough, was when I was at the Times. She visited the Times for its bicentennial and uh, made a comment to our Labour editor, which sounded like she was blaming Arthur Scargill for the miners' strike. I mean, it was you know, hotly disputed at the time. Um, we know that she was unhappy with Margaret Thatcher over her refusal to sanction the apartheid regime in South Africa. There were very, very few. There was the comment, the well-calibrated comment during the Scottish referendum. I hope voters will think very carefully before they cast their vote or words that effect, you know, which sent the message she wanted. But, you know, there were practically none of them. I mean, Tony Blair said, you know, I was prime minister for 12 years and I still have no idea what the Queen's real views are. She's had pretty much a lifetime to practice inscrutability Whereas Prince Charles, now King Charles, has had a lifetime of activism and lobbying and, and learning what his views are and learning how to express them very clearly. So will we expect the same from King Charles, the same reservation, the same um, inscrutability that we've seen from Queen Elizabeth? Well, the signals he's been sending since the Queen's death are yes. You know, he will abide by the constitu constitutional requirement to remain politically impartial. But you know, he's got a short fuse. He's quite headstrong. He's got a messianic streak about him. Um, and he feels deeply, deeply, deeply about the causes that he's embraced. So I think what he will try and do is find ways of expressing his views or, or, ex or exerting influence that aren't overt, that are very private. So, for instance, you know, under the Constitution, he has the right to uh, consult, encourage, warn prime ministers. And you know, in his weekly audience with the prime minister, I'm sure he'll use that right, those rights to the full. He can make speeches in much more measured tones than he has done so far. He can choose who or where he visits and sends signals that way. He's already signaled quite strongly that he will use Prince William, the new Prince of Wales, um, to make speeches on the causes that they both embrace, conservation, climate change, that sort of thing in the environment. So there, I think he will attempt to be more subtle about it. But the idea that he's just going to stop, him, stop championing these causes I think is 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 far fetched, and I'm not sure he has the self restraint to stop himself from doing that. Yes, because his character is rather different from that of his mother's, isn't it? So, how do you think that will inform his approach in, for example, his you know private audiences with prime ministers? Well, she was self-effacing, modest. Yeah, she wasn't. Um, she didn't assert herself. I think Charles is very different. I think he he's always wanted a role in life. He spent his first 30 years searching for one. He finally found it, which was championing causes which at the time were not fashionable, be they social or environmental. And I think he's very proud of what he's done. And I think he feels vindicated and emboldened by the way, for instance, that climate change, when he started talking about it 50 years ago, he was regarded as you know, as dotty in his own words, now it's very mainstream, and he's you know he's taken the credit, and he's going to want to carry on championing those causes. That's his raison d'être. Mm. He's just got to find a way of doing it. I mean, the other problem he faces is he's he's caught in this dilemma, isn't he? He doesn't have the popularity of his mother, and really, the support for the monarchy at the moment is support for her, mm. for his mother. So he's got to justify the monarchy he's got to 
you know, make it relevant. And one way of doing that is by talking out on causes that people cares, care about. On the other hand, if he goes too far, if he strays into partisan politics, he will be seen as, you know, the monarchy will be seen as interfering, controversial, divisive, because, you know, every issue nowadays is heavily politicized. We, lived, we live in a deeply polarized country. Even climate change is heavily politicized. So if he goes too far, he risks undermining the monarchy and he may, might end up as Charles III and Charles the Last. Charles found a role as Prince of Wales um, to advocate and some say sort of meddle in political affairs. Why do you think it was important for Charles to do that? Because he wanted to make a difference. He wanted to be a man of consequence. And uh, there was the prospect of his mother continuing to reign for decades, as she did. And he was, he felt purposeless. So he began on the climate and it, it branched out into organic farming, the, the consequences of globalization, modern architecture, um, badger culls, <laughs> yeah, you name it. Uh, 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 his portfolio of causes expanded and expanded in the city blight, social deprivation, and he found a sort of way of melding them into a sort of world view. Um, but, you know, he would frequently come close to or actually cross the that narrow line and stray into politics. I mean, he, you know, he would um, enrage Thatcher, Tony Blair, on occasion Cameron, certainly Boris Johnson. Uh, you know, one of his biographers said he, since he turned 21, he met eight prime ministers and countless politicians, and there was very lit little respect on either side. Who do you think was the prime minister to whom Charles's political views most closely align? Well, it's interesting. You can't classify. Charles's political views are very hard to pigeonhole, because on the one hand, he was a, he is a traditionalist. Yeah, he's he's the supporter of local traditional farming, the countryside alliance, tradition, in various forms. But on the other hand, he support he fought for to to ease um, social deprivation, fought for the inner cities, fought for climate change. Yeah, he embraced any number of progressive views. It, so he's quite. Difficult to, it's difficult, you know, it, someone asked me which party he would vote for. I have no idea. Yeah, I think one prime minister accused him of being a social democrat, social SDP supporter, but yeah, we've, we don't know. And I mean, he is quite idiosyncratic in the courses he, he embraces. Which prime minister would he be closest to? I mean, I, I'd be tempted to say Tony Blair, except he clashed with Tony Blair quite a lot on Labour's education policy, on badger culls, on various subjects. I think Blair was infuriated by him. In the piece, you mentioned that he had some training from David Cameron. Is that right? Well, David Cameron said that on uh, on the BBC last Sunday, right. on the Laura Koonsberg show. David Cameron did say he was a brilliant listener, brilliant questioner, and he had the skills that would mm. mean that those weekly audiences were really useful for both him and for the Prime Minister. If you're enjoying this interview so far, please hit the like button below. That will really help other people to find it and leave us a comment. Thank you. One of Liz Truss's first challenges is the energy crisis. Indeed, news of the Queen's death broke on the day when Liz Truss was announcing her plans to help people cope with their energy bills. Um, and as part of those plans, Liz Truss has cancelled the moratorium on fracking. Um, and she and Jacob Rees-Mogg have been talking about increasing the UK's production of oil and gas. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, they've got the, uh, the issues of, sort of the pledges that they've made to try and achieve net zero by 2050. Mm. Climate is going to be a very pressing issue during King Charles's reign. And he's been advocating on the issue for decades. How is he going to respond if Liz Truss's right wing government pass... Yeah. Royal, uh, seek royal assent for bills with which he vigorously well, this disagrees. This is really interesting because you know, for the first time, we know exactly what a monarch's views are. So if Liz Truss comes to him and seeks royal assent for a bill that dilutes the commitment to net zero by 
2050, for example. It doesn't have to be on the environment. It could be a bill you know, that jettisons the Northern Irish Protocol and endangers the Good Friday Agreement. What is he going to do? I mean, the first thing he'll do is in private, he will use his access to the prime minister, his weekly audience, to very forcefully argue against it, I suspect, to press his case. But if the prime minister doesn't listen, if she proceeds with her plans, and she's fairly doctrinaire as well, what gives? Does he give royal assent to a bill or does he read out you know, in the sort of opening of parliament a bill with which he obviously and profoundly disagrees? It's going to be really, really interesting. And Mike Bartlett, you know, the playwright, explored this in his play Charles III. You know, it might suddenly become much more relevant and much more real life than we ever imagined when that play was first staged in 2014. What would that mean for the UK if, uh, if that well, collision happened? It would be a constitutional crisis. And I don't know. You know. We haven't been there before. We'd be in uncharted territory because obviously you know, the Queen never never did that. I mean, you know, I, I guess the sort of dispute with Margaret Thatcher over South African sanctions was as close as we came to a public falling out between the monarch and the prime minister. But, you know, they, they resolved that in private. I don't know. I mean, you know, you have two strong-minded people, both with their own power base, both with their own megaphones, confronting each other on, you know, a pretty hefty issue. Um, I don't know the answer. We would have to see. I mean, I, my guess is it won't come to that. You know, I think they'd both pull back or they'd find a compromise, but you can never be sure. Do you think the so-called black spider memos will continue? No, no. Um, you know, <laughs> Charles was called the meddling prince, wasn't he? And uh, you know, I think he's he's quite... You know, he said in his first speech, you know, I've got to, I've got less time to devote to the issues I care about. You know, that was a signal. My life will, of course, change as I take up my new responsibilities. It will no longer be possible for me to give so much of my time and energies to the charities and issues for which I care so deeply. He's got to stop doing that. He's got to stop summoning ministers to, well, he used to summon them to Clarence House to wherever he'll be based now. No, he's going to be much more circumspect about that sort of thing. I mean, that, you know, that's an example of how he can um, accommodate, his new accommodate himself to his new position. Um, you know, I think his speeches have, in the last few years have by and large become much more measured. I mean, there was the, the case of him calling... Um, Boris Johnson's Rwanda policy appalling, but I mean that was a statement he made in private mm. and got into the public realm. It's a, mm. I think his speeches have been softer in tone that they than they would have been a decade ago, for instance. Mm. But this is a challenge now, isn't it, for the modern king, which is when you know Elizabeth came to the throne, it was the age of the wireless, yeah. whereas now you know King Charles is coming to the throne in the age of social media, where everything can be uh, made public in the space of a tweet. So, you know, how do you think Charles is going to respond to that? Well, I think you know, he's, he's already suggested his monarchy, he's already shown that his monarchy will be much more open, much more informal. And, you know, you had members of the public invited to St. Paul's last week. You have him kissing people in front of Buckingham Palace. You know, it, it's much more, um, you know, his, his language is much more personal than the Queen ever used. But with that comes come dangers, you know, the, the loss of the mystique. The, um, I mean, I think he has to do it. I don't think the monarchy can remain quite as remote and aloof as it sometimes has been. But, you know, it, as, I, as I've said before, he can be quite outspoken. Yeah, you know, he's got a lot of his father about him. There's a slightly, you know, the, the off-the-cuff remarks that turn out to be rather explosive. You know, there's, I can... I'd be amazed if those dry up. <laughs> King Charles is not going to be able to write black spider letters. He's not going to be able to make speeches, you know, that espouse his his causes. Um, what tools will he have at his disposal to make his views known? 
Well, constitutionally, he has the ability to exert considerable influence behind the scenes through his access, weekly access, to the Prime Minister. And I have no doubt that he will use that to the full. The question is whether he goes beyond that, whether he can restrain himself, whether he wants to restrain himself, um, or whether he considers it his role in life, his duty in life, to be the people's tribune, the champion of unfashionable causes, the man who uses his bully pulpit, his megaphone as king, to embrace, to champion causes that might otherwise be left on the margins. Well, we will wait and see. Martin Fletcher, thank you very much. Thank you. You can read Martin's feature online at newstatesman.com or in the New Statesman magazine. Our political editor, Andrew Marr, spoke to the New Statesman's podcast team about how the UK is likely to change after the death of Queen Elizabeth. And you can watch that video right here. If you would like more videos from the New Statesman, please make sure that you subscribe to this YouTube channel. We release new videos every week to help you understand what's really happening in UK politics.